Um, I am uh, very uh, excited um, for the next several weeks of what I believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, will be catalytic uh, for our church, for our city, for our region, uh, and for our state. And uh, I am believing very strongly that um, as we step into our 40th year of existence, um, that we will step into it with a fresh perspective, with a fresh authority, with fresh power, with fresh zeal, with fresh hunger for the things of God. And so you've heard us talk about, but I want you to understand the prayer uh, that I've had. You can go to a lot of events. You don't need something more to do on your calendar. So why would we put together a few days um, of gathering and worshiping and scripture reading and praying for one another? Because uh, I do believe this will serve as a spiritual catalyst that will ignite fresh hunger in us as a church, in our region, and in the area. Where the things that we used to be distracted by, the things that we used to be caught up in, will grow strangely dim. And we will step into year 40 with the authority of Christ Jesus. And we will take territory for the kingdom of God. Amen? So, uh, if, you, if you did not sign up for that, uh, just get here and uh, we'll try to make room for you. Uh, the best that we can. Uh, I'll say one last thing before we read text today. And um, next Sunday, uh, Pastor Dave Patterson is going to be with us. And um, he's my pastor, by the way. And uh, he is stewarding an incredible church, an incredible move of God up in Northern California. Several locations throughout the region there are seeing signs, miracles, and wonders. They operate strongly in the prophetic. And uh, just excited to have him next Sunday to kind of kick us off for that week. So uh, don't miss next Sunday. Bring a friend with you. I promise you it will be powerful. Uh, we're going to close our series today, wrap up our series, I should say, uh, in our day. And if you've been tracking with us and journeying with us over the last few weeks, uh, we really uh, have been touched by Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, where it literally says that we've heard of your fame. We've heard of your deeds. And the heart's cry that we've been landing on is, God, would you repeat them in our day? Anybody in the room hungry to see God repeat his fame, his deeds, his power in our day? We want to see a move of God. Not just okay with reading about it in his word. Not just okay with reading about it in historical books, about historical moves of God. I want to experience one and be a part of one in our day for the glory of God. So we've been uh, looking at some things that I believe will position us. And today... Um, I believe um, might be the, the, the most important of all three weeks, and um, it's also going to be the most challenging. So uh, I'm going to throw it out there. There's going to be a lot of awkward moments in our time together today, and I do not apologize uh, for that because I had a lot of awkward moments with God recently. So um, let's go to Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. And um, this is a passage that, that, that has equally haunted me and inspired me. Um, and even when we had first uh, moved here, my family and I, just over six years ago, uh, this was one of the passages that was on the forefront uh, of my mind, forefront of my prayer. And part of what I believe that God wanted to uh, do as part of our assignment um, in, in, in calling a community back to God and to the things of God, calling a city to worship God. And so um, let me say it this way. What I believe that God wants to do in the next several days, weeks, and months um, will be dependent individually, because he's still going to move corporately, he, but, but we can miss out on what God wants to do even individually. So today's message is, is really about positioning our hearts to the things of God. Hosea prophet Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 it says sow for yourselves righteousness and reap in mercy break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and he rains righteousness on you that's it just one verse for today and I can preach this one verse for about an hour and 30 minutes. So it doesn't mean it's going to be any shorter. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. This is the passage that the text, the statement that has haunted me. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. Till he comes. 
and rains righteousness upon you. I want to um, speak to you, use this text today from the title, A Breakup Call. <laughs> a Breakup Call. If you had had any level of junior high relationship in your life, of dating in, in middle school, I should say, you've probably received a breakup call or two. But the call today that I believe that God wants to call us all to is to break up the fallow ground in our hearts. The areas that have hardened, the areas that have been neglected, the areas where the seed of God is still sown, but we still do not respond because of the condition of our hearts. So the call is to break up fallow ground because I believe, as the scripture says, it is time and it is the hour, it is now, it is immediate that we are called to seek the Lord. With all that's happening in your world, with all that's happening in our world, wars, rumors of wars, catastrophic events, earthquakes, I believe we are in some birthing pains. I believe humanity is crying out for our King. And it starts with our church. It starts with the church, I should say. The church breaking up the fallow ground of our hearts and seeking the Lord. So God, we love you. Father, I thank you for even the moments that we sing songs together. I thank you that even as we fix our gaze and our attention on you, faith is elevated in this room. God, our, our, our hearts are posture. We, we declare today that your word will fall on the good soil of our hearts, that it will produce a hundredfold that which is sown. So God, would you speak to us today? God, I, my, my, my prayer this week is that you would give your church spiritual eyes, spiritual eyes to see and to be made aware of the fallow ground within our own hearts that must be broken up. So Spirit of God, would you go to work today? We're eager, we're hungry for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. So what I want to communicate, articulate today is really uh, a journey that I've been on and the intensity of the journey that I've been on as a result of this birth, or this verse I should say, uh, has greatly increased in the hour that I feel like we are in. So let me first share a story because it's interesting in text that um, both Old and New Testament will use agricultural terms, agricultural references to articulate deep truths about the kingdom of God. Now for somebody like me that doesn't do much work with his hands, I have to do a whole bunch of research around this. So in, in, in reading around this, I want to really help paint a picture that I heard this week from someone that I believe helps paint the, 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 the totality of the picture that Jesus is trying, that the, the prophet is trying through, through the prophet, that God's trying to communicate through the prophet to you and I today. Here's the picture as we think about the soil of our hearts. Let's say that you are a farmer. And God came and he had entrusted you with a hundred acres of land. A hundred acres of very fertile soil where you could plant anything that you would want and as long as you tended to it, it would flourish. Well, as time went on and life seemed to have passed us by that maybe certain situations had happened, let's just say maybe we lost some of the workers that we had a part of our farming team and so we were no longer able to tend to several acres let's say that maybe as we grew in age we weren't able to necessarily work as hard as we felt that maybe just by the overwhelming day-to-day -day activity we realized that we could really only take care of about 10 of those acres Meanwhile, 90 of those acres are now overgrown. The ground is extremely hard. Weeds have flooded the area in which God gave us. And we have 10% of our acreage that is still good and still that we keep. Meanwhile, we've neglected the other 90%. I want to suggest that this just might be a picture 
of the current state of our hearts today. I think it is true that there are sections and fragments of our heart as it pertains to the things of God, to the word of God, to the kingdom of God, that if we were to evaluate, we would say, yeah, there's probably 10% of my heart that is good soil. But because of life, because of situations, because of turmoil, because of hurts, because of pains, whatever the excuse may be, we've neglected 90% of the soil that God has entrusted us with. So I want to use agriculture today, and I want to use this one simple verse and literally take it line by line and unpack what I believe God is communicating to us for what he wants to do in the days and the weeks and the months ahead will be dependent upon the soil of our hearts. Hosea is a really interesting book in the Bible. If you're not familiar with it, Hosea is a prophet and it really is a prophetic picture of God's love for us because here's essentially what happens in the text. God tells uh, the prophet Hosea, that he is to marry Gomer. Gomer, by the way, is a prostitute. Not only is she a prostitute, but she continues to be unfaithful. Could you imagine God coming to the priest today saying, go marry the prostitute. That would go well in our churches, would it not? So in his obedience to God, he pursues Gomer time and time again. And yet, even in Hosea's radical pursuit of Gomer, she continues to be unfaithful. God uses this as the backdrop to paint a picture of the people of Israel. The people of Israel, represented by Gomer, are those who have a relationship or have a, a husband. We are the bride to Christ Jesus, but we continue to pursue our own wants, our own desires, and go and get caught up in our wicked ways. And yet God, in his radical love for us, continues to chase us down, to show up time and time again in a radical pursuit of you and I. That's the story. That's, that's essentially what the this book of the Bible will paint the picture of for you and I. But I want to now dive into the prophetic picture that it paints for us as a church because this is a letter that's written to the people of Israel. The people of Israel, by the way, if you're wondering who are we, we are the modern day people of Israel, the people of Israel or the people of God. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we become a part of the body of Christ. Guess what? We are the New Testament version of the people of Israel called the local church. So he's using this story, and what happened at this time is the people of Israel experienced great prosperity. They had experienced the abundance of God, that the blessing of God was poured upon his people, and they lived in great and prosperous times, but their heir in their sin, that in the prosperity that God gave them, they continue to squander the wealth of God and use it on sinful things, on idolatrous things, on the things of the world. And we're living a very distracted life using the blessings that God gave them for their own benefit and for their own gain. Does it sound a little similar to the amazing country that we live in today? Let me just remind you, God's been very good to you, United States of America. He has been so gracious. We live in a very prosperous land. We live in a land that God has bestowed his blessing upon for quite some time. I think our heir, people of God, people of Israel, is that if we're not careful, we have taken the abundance and the blessings of God and we've squandered them on our own desires, our own idols, our own things of luxury, not all bad in and of itself, but they have taken the seat of God within our hearts. And we live a distracted life. We live a life where God can have that section of our heart that we say is good soil. But what if I were to say today, God wants your entire heart. So understanding that this is the cultural and historical context of what we read today. 
the prophet stands up and he addresses the people of Israel, God's people, who you could say have fallen spiritually asleep, who are indulging in all of the luxuries and the things that the world has to offer them. God says, so for yourselves, righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. Till he comes and he rains righteousness on you. Let me just take this line by line, understanding the agricultural truth that even as the prophet Hosea articulated, so does Jesus, which we will get to here in a few moments. He says, sow for yourselves righteousness and reap in mercy. It's important to understand that Israel had sown seeds of sin and they will soon reap the judgment of God. By the way, the judgment of God is still for you and I today. You and I will give an account to God, and I think if we're not careful, we can diminish in our, in our lack of the awe and the fear of God. We have diminished the judgment of God, which is a very frightful thing, by the way. And so the prophet calls the nation, and he says, sow for yourselves seeds of righteousness, and you will reap a harvest of mercy. We also seize into our life, don't we? But the question that I believe the prophet is wanting us to wrestle with today, are we sowing seeds of righteousness? Galatians 6, 7, and 8 will say, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he, whoever sows to please their flesh, from their flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So here's a question that I want to ask for you because we have to understand. Let, let, let me, from the onset of this, answer the question, what is the seed? Jesus will talk about this. The Old Testament talked about this. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God that goes forth. So really what we're examining today is what is the condition of our heart as we receive the word of God. So the seed. And here's what's amazing to me. The seed has never changed. And if the seed has never changed, guess what? The power of the seed has never changed. The power of the word of God has not changed. And so why is it that we can read about all these amazing things in scripture, all these amazing things in history and be like, wow, God, did they have a better Bible than us? Because I think there's, an all, there's also a human element in what we would call revival. It's his people being humbled again, being called back to Christ Jesus, leading out in repentance. Starting to sow seeds of righteousness. So understanding that the seed we're talking about today is the word of God. And understanding that the soil is the condition of our heart as we receive the word of God. We also acknowledged earlier that all of us are sowing some level of seed into our life. So the question is this. What crop will grow up from the seeds that you planted this morning? Or this past week? or this past month, or the past few years. And it's in that that the prophet says, even now, you can sow seeds of righteousness and reap in mercy. So if I've been sowing bad seeds into my life, if there's still breath in my lungs, even now, I can sow seeds of righteousness. Sowing seeds of righteousness, we live in such a busy and distracted world, do we not? Where I think if we're not careful, we'll get into this in a moment, but escapism, I would say, is our greatest enemy. The point I want to articulate as we wrestle with this a little bit is sowing seeds of righteousness means making God's word the foundation of 
of our decisions, actions, and attitudes. The Word of God, the unchanging, infallible, perfect Word of God. This dictates our actions, our thoughts, our decisions, our outlook. It is not dictated by so-and-so on Twitter or whatever they call it today. It is not dictated by the news source that you have a preference of. Come on, our life, our perspective, our actions are dictated by the Word of God that is the seed. So a few things that I, I think are great indicators of what we're sowing into our life. Like here, here's one that, that God had me chew on recently. He's, Kevin, what is your current zeal for me and the things of me? Now, I know I can come across as a pretty passionate individual. And sometimes it may be overwhelming for you. And in my immature years, I used to apologize for that. Guess what? I got a haircut yesterday because I'm getting gray hairs. And those gray hairs are reminding me that I'm not going to allow you to tell me to be less passionate. Rather, I'm going to use it as full fuel to burn even brighter for the things of God. Because here's what's true in our world. Our world is filled with passionate people. I'll give you an example. Today, there will be hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of Americans that will gather in worship houses, some called stadiums or coliseums, throughout our great nation. There will be grown men that will rip their shirts off, <laughs> that will paint their chests with their team's logo, they will drink way too much beer, and they will scream for four hours at other men on a field. You talk too loud in church. No, I, I don't lift my hands in worship, but my heart, God, 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 no. Bro, I saw you with your shirt off pounding your chest. So, so, so I'm using this, right? I'm pushing a little bit. All, all that's great. You got a favorite sports team is great, but, but if you worship your sports team harder than you worship Jesus, there's some soil that needs to be broken. What's my current situation in the area of my integrity? The integer of one. The, the same that you see is the same that you get no matter what situation I may find myself in. What, what, what's my current level of humility at? H how am I at? And, 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 and even having some conversations, even last service, the, the reminder and this is going to push on your toes, and I don't apologize for it because the Holy Spirit is working in all of our lives. Let me just say it like this. A lot of times our insecurities are pride in disguise because we use our insecurities to try to get the attention of others to look at us in our challenges and our difficulties. There's a common root. And what we need is to uproot some things in our own life. Here's one that will be quiet as soon as I say it. What is my current level of generosity? Generosity is an attribute of people who have been transformed by God, who serve a God, who gave his one and only, who gave his very best. It is a common attribute in both Old Testament and New Testament. It is actually an identifier that believers, the early believers, were marked by generosity. What good is seed in your pocket? Because guess what? I ain't never had a, a seed grow in my pocket. That's got to be planted and continually planted. What's my response like to the things that I see happening in our world? Is it of love? Is it of kindness and compassion? When I see videos of innocent moms and dads and sons and daughters and grandmas and grandpas and children being executed and murdered for something they didn't even do, 
we, we just watch this like it's common. Like that we, how are we growing numb to the things that actually break the heart of God? find myself weeping and praying for the peace of Jerusalem and the peace of this chaos and all the wars and the rumors of war. All I know, the only hope that we have is to break up the fallow ground and start seeking the Lord again. So we're all sowing seeds. How, how can we tell where we're sowing seeds? We sow seeds where we spend most of our time. Now, I understand you, you got to have a job. This, I'm not telling you to quit your job. you you got to work. It's good to work. It's a biblical principle. Work is a good thing. And all God's people said. But oftentimes, you'll, you'll hear, I just don't have time. And as I referenced earlier, I want to unpack this a little bit. I, I believe... In our modern world that we live in, escapism is our greatest enemy. I used to say distraction, but I think it's deeper than that. Because we're using distraction to escape from the realities of life. And we're using our time to be filled in these distractions. By the way, the average American will spend seven hours a day in front of a screen. It's a lot. Seven hours a day. Netflix has figured out a way to get us to binge watch television. They snap off the ending. It rolls right into the next episode. And it keeps going. You've made your way through four bags of popcorn. You're all greasy. You're wondering what happened. What if I gave God some of my time of escape? Hey, this is the journey that I've been on and some of the things he's calling me into in even deeper ways. Because the more that I, let's just say, escape into God, the less I actually want to escape. Because when I escape into him, I realize that the Prince of Peace is there. And if the Prince of Peace is there, I don't need to run away from the chaos of the situations and trials and struggles that I am because I'm right where I'm at. God knows right where I'm at. He's with me right where I'm at. He's the hope in right where I'm at. This is the perspective that begins to shift and to change. For me, to be very honest and transparent, I'll just kind of jump off the edge of the stage today in full transparency, I love sports. I love sport. Like, like if, if I had it up to me and all my vices, if I wasn't working, I would be feet up watching whatever sport is on television. I mean, I could just get, I don't even, do you know any of these players on these teams? No, but it's ball sport and I love it. And if I'm not careful, I can literally waste my life away in front of a television watching sport. I just felt from God calling me away in the amount of time that I was spending in front of a television to watch sport. To just spend with him. And it's amazing what begins to happen in your life and your perspective The stuff you start to feel, your outlook on the world. I used to think about, I mean, how, how could these great men and women of God that I so greatly appreciate and read about, they would often talk about, or people would talk about them, how they spend like six hours with God a day. I'm like, what? Are they American or not? <laughs> so how do you, like, spend six hours? And what I found is like, I just set aside six minutes. Six minutes of reading turns into another six minutes of prayer. Turns into another six minutes of worship. Turns into another six minutes of exhortation. Turns into another six minutes of going a little bit deeper. 
turns into another six minutes of God just downloading, speaking to you some things. It turns into another six minutes of you just starting to journal. And before you know it, you get to a space where you look up and you're like, wow, that was a really long time. What happened to the time? So I think sometimes just to encourage you, we too often want to be like these great men and women. We're like, I got to get on my knees for six hours. Here's something very practical. Just start somewhere. Just some of the things that you would escape or use to escape. What if you just gave God some of that time? So sow those seeds is what pastor's saying. Sow those seeds of righteousness. And you will reap in mercy. And now he's going to get all up in our toe jam. Y'all ready? <laughs> Break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. This is the breakup call today. This is that painful junior high, middle school girlfriend calling you to break up. Break up your fallow ground. Now, fallow is not really a term we use in our language much anymore. When was the last time you talked to somebody and been like, how are you doing? We, we like seasons at church, right? So we always tell people we're, we're in a good season. When was the last time you heard somebody say, I'm in a fallow season? But to paint the picture and to understand fallow, fallow is ground that hasn't been plowed for more than a year. It's ground that is hard. It's ground that is stubborn and resistant to the seed. So again, what is the current condition of my heart? To the entirety of the seed that is the word of God. Here's the point. It does a seed little good, or it does little good, I should say, to sow seed on fallow ground. It must first be broken up. And this is why I felt like God said, call this the breakup. This is the breakup today. It is time to break up the fallow ground of our hearts. Jesus even talked about this. Jesus shared a parable to his disciples and did a teaching to them about a farmer who sows seed in the different types of soil. And his disciples basically come back to him. They're like, yo, Jesus, um, what did you mean by that? Help me understand what you mean. So Matthew 13 18 to 23, it says, listen, then this is what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, there's the seed, there's the word of God, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that has been sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word of God at once and receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on the good soil, and this is also strategically why I pray the same prayer every Sunday after I read a text. The good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Let's just consider the ground for a minute. He talks about the path, the path. Sometimes we allow the word no room in our life at all. I've seen this a lot recently. It's like we get so worked up on issues that are represented in our world 
and we give no thought to what God's word actually would say to those issues because we know that those issues may not agree with what I want them to agree with. So this path, the scripture says, that has been trampled down on has no room for the seed to take root. He talks about rocky ground. Sometimes we have flashes of enthusiasm. This is like, man, we're going up to the youth camp and we come down ready to change the world. And then Tuesday, the first day of school hits and it's like we never had the youth camp in the first place. And it quickly burns out. Why? Because there's no root. The winds come and we'll take that seed or we'll take that little small plant away because there was no root system to withhold it. Pastor, what would you say has been happening? Let me say what I have seen firsthand happen, unfortunately, and it breaks my heart. I've seen the winds of chaos come and believers be blown away who received the word with joy and enthusiasm, but they had no root in the word. And the wind has blown them away. He talks about the thorns. Here's one that I believe is applicable to a stronghold in our region. The thorns, this is the cares of the world. This is the deceitfulness of riches. And how they're constantly threatening to choke out God's word and fruitfulness in our life. But like the good soil, the word bears fruit in all of our lives. And here's where I'm at in life. God, continue to lead me to do the hard things to break up the fallow ground. Because I want all of my heart to be good soil for your word. I'll give you an indicator, just personally again, I'm just, this is free counseling for me, so thank you for showing up. <laughs> One of the indicators for me that I've realized in my life that there's some soil that needs to be broken, some fallow ground that needs to be broken up. I remember growing up in church, and um, my, my parents made church a priority uh, every Sunday, we would be at a church service. We were a part of a local church, serving the local church. And even as a sports head, yes, I played sports, but my mom and my dad would say, Kevin, I know you got a game at 10. You better tell your basketball coach you're only going to be there for the second half. That's, that's, that's how I grew up. Some of you are like, wow, that's really intense. It worked for me. <laughs> All those other friends that said they were Christians that I played basketball with, they got blown away. But I remember in church, the pastor would get up, preach a message, and the church I grew up in was a really large one, massive room, 2,500 seats would articulate the gospel. At the end of the message, he would give what we call an altar call or a salvation call to place your faith in Jesus, to repent, to turn from your wicked ways, and turn towards God. Speaking about the love and the grace of God that covers a multitude of sins. And sure enough, every week after week, I remember being even a young teenage boy, and they would always say, everybody bow your head and close your eyes. And I was like, mm -hmm. I still do it, by the way. I'm still that guy. Why? Because I remember watching, watching a dad who tried everything that the world had stand up and respond. I remember watching a single mom with her kids stand up in the back of the room and respond. I remember watching a teenager stand up and respond to the good news of the gospel. And every single time I would do my peekaboo move and see tears flowing down people's face, watching God transform their heart, guess what I was met with? Tears started flowing down my face, understanding that God was working in their life, that people were crossing over from death into life. And it's a beautiful thing. But here's how I know I have some fallow ground. Same things happen, and I become unmoved by the activity of God in people's life. 
I, I become so numb as if, man, it's not as important then as it is today. And God says, Kevin, there's, there, there's something going on on the inside of you. And I think if we're not careful, we can respond very apathetically to what God is doing in people's lives. Just this last service, I had a young man who, the same young man that came up to me at the gym several months back, and he was in a rehab program, and he said, hey, I've been watching you online. He said, hey, I can't get to church right now. My girlfriend is still there, and, and her daughter's still there. They're, they're, they're coming. They're, they're, they're watching. They're telling me about it, but right now I'm in this rehab home. That same young man came up to me after first service with tears in his face, said, thank you for changing my life. I'm a year and a half sober, and I'm thankful to be a part of this church telling you, man, I started crying before he started crying. Here's what I learned. Here's the point that we must chew on and wrestle with. I am responsible to break up the fallow ground of my heart. Nobody else is. If you're waiting on somebody else to come along and break up the fallow ground, he says, you sow seeds of righteousness and you'll reap mercy. Break up the fallow ground of your heart. So the responsibility to break up and to till the soil of our heart is up to us. But here's what's difficult. Fallow ground is hard. And it probably doesn't want to be broken up. So I'll just... What if there's a beautiful invitation to experience the fullness of what God has for your life once we till up the soil of our heart? We allow the blades of the Spirit of God to cut up the hard soil so that as His seed that is sown would begin to be planted on the good soil of our heart. I'm going to ask the band to come and We'll wrap up today. Break up your fallow ground. And then he says, it is time to seek the Lord. There's an immediacy to it. There's an urgency to it. And I just came to remind you today, you came here to be reminded by God today, it is time to seek the Lord. We don't need to wait for something else to happen. We don't need to wait for, for, for this, you know, one of our kids to get out of this season of life. We don't need to wait. It is time to seek the Lord. We do this by seeking the Lord, not ourselves, Not our own idols. And we have a whole lot of idols that, that if we were to be honest, man, we can be distracted by a whole bunch. He doesn't even tell us to seek our own preference. I got a lot of preferences, y'all. But I'm also crazy enough to be the one when I'll go into other churches. Let's just say they're smaller. There's only a few people in the room. It's pretty empty. The music is horrible. I'm still the one lifting my hands because those people aren't there to put on a concert for me. They're not singing to me. They're singing to God, and I want to join them in singing to our king. So I can, I, I can, may not be my preference, but they're not singing to me. I know we may not be your preference of music, but can I remind you, sir? These aren't songs to you. So I'm just going to give you a short journey of some things that I've found. Maybe it's just a simple process. I would write these down. If you're wondering, like, what do I do? What, what are some practical things that I can do? And seeking the Lord and breaking up fallow ground, I think the first thing I would say is self-examination. You've got to be honest. By the way, you, you are never fooling God. He knows the condition of your heart. So we have to be honest. And then I've, I've said this before, but I believe that will lead you to the lost R word in church, Repentance where we acknowledge any sin, we acknowledge any disobedience, any neglect spiritually that has contributed to the hardness of our hearts. And we turn to God and we confess our sins and we ask God for forgiveness and 
Because 1 John 1, 9 will tell us that we will be forgiven, that we love even because he first loved us. We engage in prayer, not just like, like, God, thank you for this food. Yeah, that's great. Thank him for the food. But I'm talking about earnestly crying out to God. Worship. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Worshiping God through prayer, through song, through praise. Expressing our adoration to God. Oh, but pastor, God knows my heart. You're right. Tell your body and your face to respond to what your heart says about God. About reading and meditating on God's word. I can't tell you, man, even, even when I'm reading books like Lamentations, and I said Lamentations on purpose. It's easy to be over like, oh my God, God still will show me. He'll still speak to you. He'll drop a nugget. He'll speak to your spirit. About accountability. Like, and the one that we always talk about at church is like accountability for sin. Yeah, that's great. What about accountability for your spiritual growth? Like, maybe that's spouses. Like, encourage one another. Hey, did you, like, you're about to get into a fight and an argument because you, you haven't either had a Snickers or you haven't spent your time with Jesus. And my wife will talk to me like that, and it's never a Snickers. Just go get in your prayer closet. Fasting. This isn't just something we do intermittently to lose weight. Fasting helps us focus on spiritual matters. Giving up of food to say, God, rather than eating this or the time that I would be giving to eating this or the time that I would be given to escaping this thing. God, I'm giving you that portion to fix my eyes on you, to begin to pray to you, to contend for some things to change, to be met by you, to seek your presence, to seek the truth, to seek what it is you want to have for myself, for my life, for my family, for my community, and so on and so on. time it's time to seek the lord and the holy spirit is the best revealer on what you need to do i just gave you a whole bunch of practical things to consider now you need to go to god and say god what is it that that that, that i need to do to break up the fallow ground for it's time to seek the lord and then he closes And he says, till he comes and he rains righteousness on you. I'm telling you, the reign of the righteousness of God is about to fall. And this isn't just some pastor, preacher, hyperbole. I'm telling you, the reign of the righteousness of God is about to fall. Historically, any time we've seen a nation, a world, in an uproar like this, the righteousness reign of God is about to fall. But pastor, doesn't he make it rain on the just and the unjust alike? You are 100% correct. But there are also times and seasons that he withholds the rain to get his attention of his people. And he raises up a prophet a prophet that will begin to call a nation back to worship, that will call the people of Israel back to worshiping a king, back to worshiping the true savior, savior to give, become uh, giving up of their distractions of all the pleasures of life. And he'll call and he'll prophesy to the wind. He'll prophesy, he'll say, I hear the sound. I hear the sound of abundance. I hear the sound of rain. Can I tell you that we may be looking at a world that is in chaos, but I hear, I hear the sound of rain because my faith, it doesn't come by what I see. It comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I hear the sound of rain. And I just want to position myself in a way to receive the early rain of the righteousness of God. I don't want to miss out on a season to receive the rain to bear fruit. To say, oh man, four months from now the harvest is right. God says, no, pick up your eyes. The harvest is now. It is now, it is now, it is now. Oh, Jesus. I'll show you a picture. I'll show you a picture of Death Valley and 
That's a picture of me. That's Death Valley. Death Valley is literally one of the hottest places to live in our nation. By the way, nobody actually lives there because it's so incredibly hot. It's also believed that because of the climate, Death Valley actually doesn't receive rain. So uh, I'm showing you this picture because for three years we've heard California's too evil. California's too dry. All, all, all of their politics and all of the, all, all of the Hollywood and the, and the stuff. And so we've we, we got to pack our bags and move to Texas. God bless you. And what, what essentially they're saying is it, it, it is dry ground. 2004, seven inches of rain fell in Death Valley. This unexpected phenomenon. And what's amazing is that rain would produce what is called a super bloom. Can I show you the same Death Valley after that rain? Look at this. <laughs> Here's what they realized. Death Valley wasn't dead. The seeds were in the ground all along. But the fallow ground had to be broken up. That when the rains came, the rains came, the rains came, guess what? It watered the seeds that were in the ground. And those seeds that were in the ground, once they received rain, started to put forth a super bloom that looks beautiful. Can I just tell you, out of the death in your life, God is still making beautiful things. Out of the chaos in our state and in our nation, God is still bringing forth a super bloom. And it starts with the church of Jesus Christ rising up to say, God, God, I'm committing to break up the fallow ground of my heart. Come on, I'm going to sow seeds of righteousness for in due time I will reap mercy God I'm believing it is time to seek it is time to seek the Lord it is time to seek the Lord until he comes until he comes again and he reigns and he rules and he comes with the sword and he comes on his white horse and he ushers in the bride of Christ Jesus and he says well done good and faithful servant until the reign of righteousness pours come on I want to be one that is caught up oh it's time to sing it's time to seek it's time to cry out to our king
time to break up. It's time to break up the fallow ground, and I want to pray with you. If that's you, you're saying, man, there's, there's some spaces in my heart that are hardened towards the things of God, and I need to break them up. God, you, you know, God, you know the condition of our hearts. God, we respond in boldness and in strength today to breaking up the fallow ground. God, the areas in our heart that are hardened towards you, towards the things of you, that are hardened towards your word. God, I pray that you would take this heart of stone and you would make it a heart of flesh again. That God, as your word continues to go forth, we say it will continually produce much fruit in our life, we pray. So God, we repent. We repent for allowing the weeds to choke us out. We repent for allowing the rocky soil of our hearts to wash the seed away. We thank you that even now, even now we can sow seeds of righteousness and in time reap mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're far from God, if you're living a life of sin, you find yourself caught up in destruction and disaster, you find yourself having partaken of all the stuff that the world has to offer, and you're here today, you find yourself still empty, still lonely, still broken. I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to our King king that got a hold of this 16 year old changed his life you might be caught up in sin sin that you feel so ashamed to tell anyone about I want you to know that the blood of Jesus has covered a multitude of sin that he loved you so much that he took your place for the death that you deserve so that you and I could be the righteousness of God. So how do we do this? We place our faith. Scripture is very clear that if we confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I want to give you the opportunity to start new life to start relationship with God afresh and anew today. I'm going to ask you so boldly on the count of three just to raise your hand today to say, Pastor, this is my day. This is the day of new beginning. This is the day of a fresh start in my life and relationship with you. And if that's you, we want to celebrate with you today. Here we go. One, God loves you. Two, today is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you, just be so bold. We want to celebrate with you today. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Thank you, Jesus. I only saw two hands, but guess what? God sees every single individual that's responding. And the two men that I saw today responded to the good news of the gospel of Christ Jesus crossing over from death into life it never gets old it never gets old the angels are rejoicing and throwing a party in heaven the scripture tells us oh lord let's say this prayer together and then kaylee's going to come and close us out would you say god thank you for loving me with a steadfast and stubborn love i admit that i'm a sinner in need of a savior and so i confess and i believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God that was raised from the dead and today I place my faith in Him and I declare from this moment forward I will never be the same again in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray can we put our hands together and celebrate with the heavens